All right, welcome everyone. I can see Sendo is already set up here, which is terrific. Let me wish you all a very happy new year. I think we're not beyond the statute of limitations for me to do that. Um, we're delighted to have you with us. My name is Grant Miller. I'm the director of the Center on Global Poverty and Development. Um, it's terrific to have you joining us for the start of our speaker series for this year. Uh, the goal of the series is to foster discussion about both successes and challenges in the field of poverty alleviation and development between distinguished scholars and policymakers and the entire Stanford community. Uh, tonight, we are really delighted to have Sendhil Mullanathan joining us. Uh, Sendhil is the Robert C. Wagner Professor of Economics at Harvard University. I'm, Sendhil, I'm gonna embarrass you for a very brief period if that's okay. So Sendhil's fields of interest are behavioral economics, poverty, applied econometrics, machine learning, He's worked on a wide variety of topics, including the impact of poverty on mental bandwidth, whether or not CEO pay is excessive, the measurement of discrimination, how coarse thinking biases a wide variety of human decisions. His latest research is on machine learning and data mining techniques to better understand human behavior, which he's talking with us about this evening. He's a prolific writer. Um, he, his most recent book, and I'm not receiving any kickbacks for advertising this, is entitled Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Means So Much, and he's a very regular writer for the New York Times. Um, he's co-founded a number of organizations many of you are familiar with. Uh, one is the nonprofit organization named Ideas42, which applies behavioral sciences to public policy challenges. He also co-founded a center promoting the use of randomized controlled trials and development, uh, the Poverty Action Lab. Uh, he serves on the board of the MacArthur Foundation. He's worked in various government roles. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the National Bureau of Economic Research and BREAD. Uh, he's the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award. Uh, he's not the only one here with us tonight who was. Uh, he, he was designated a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. He was labeled a top 100 thinker by a foreign policy magazine, and he was named the, the smart list 50 people who will change the world by Wired Magazine. Okay, so now to the good stuff. Uh, so his hobbies, which I'm hoping he'll tell us a little bit about, include basketball, board games, Googling, and fixing up classic espresso machines. Um, the first thing he asked me for, he's, by the way, on his way back home from Sydney right now, was a, was a coffee when he arrived here this evening. Um, he received his BA in computer science, economics, and math, yes, all three from uh, Cornell, and his PhD in economics from Harvard. Um, I'd also like to introduce to you David Lobel, um, who will be moderating our discussion tonight. So David is a professor here at Stanford in the Department of Earth System Science. He's also a deputy director of the Center on Food Security and the Environment. He is the William Wrigley Senior Fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. He's a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and he's a faculty affiliate of our center here. His own research focuses on agriculture and food security, in particular using remote sensing or high resolution satellite imagery data uh, together with machine learning. He's been recognized with a MacArthur Fellowship, so we do have two geniuses with us, um, and with a Masawani Medal from the American Geophysical Union. Um, he served as lead author for the food chapter in the recent intergovernmental panel on climate change fifth assessment report. Um, David is a uh, proud child of Stanford. He received his PhD here at Stanford in geological and environmental sciences, uh, and he received his bachelor's degree in applied math from Brown. So we're delighted to have both Sendel and David here with us tonight. Sendel will be speaking with us on how smarter machines can lead to better policy. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I know that it's often the case that there's wine at these talks, but um, wine before the talk is kind of a nice, uh, I think it'll be good for you guys if some of you drank before this talk is what I'm trying to say. Um, let me just start uh, <clears throat> with uh, a picture. Uh, how many of you can tell me uh, what this is, if you were to describe it? Yeah, a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. Congratulations, that's an excellent job. Uh, how many of you can describe this? Yeah, person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Is that all great? Um, that, that's that's going to be my talk. It's going to be picture after picture. 
it's a very postmodern talk. And then I'll read from the then I'll read from the Great Gatsby for a while. No, um, what I <clears throat> what I what I took this from is a paper about a, I think about a year old now that was a computer vision paper where they trained an algorithm to take images such as this and automatically describe it. And it was a relatively successful exercise. Here's from a description of their chosen some sort of 16 example, uh, 12 examples of how, how well it did. Here are some of the ones on the, here that I showed you that they did well on. Here's and what I found most impressive is not just how well the algorithm did, but even how its mistakes were not that bad. So for example, here's one that is you know, somewhat related to the image, so it kind of gets it wrong. But it describes it as a skateboarder does a trick on a ramp. So you can even kind of imagine how it got it wrong. It's a bicycle doing a trick on a ramp. Uh, not too bad. Uh, there's somewhere it gets horribly wrong, like this is a yellow school bus parked in a parking lot. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that is. I'm also not quite sure whose car that is. Um, and then this one it gets very wrong. A refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. I also don't know what that is. Why someone is against the letter E is beyond me. Um, but these type of uh, exercises are fascinating to me because they are illustrative of something that is now very familiar to us in day-to-day in, uh, -day life, which is algorithms being able to do some pretty remarkable things uh, when fed the right data. And so what I wanted to do was, uh, in the last few years, I've just been trying to ask the question, um, I do a lot of work in social policy, how, in what ways can these algorithms uh, be helpful for that activity? So what I'm going to try and do is digest uh, large parts, n n a lot of it not my work, but just to ask the question and to present to you where I think some of the really interesting avenues are that people are working on where this uh, can be very uh, helpful and what some future avenues are for development. And the bottom line I think I'm going to try and convey to you is that we're on the cusp of something I think pretty transformative. And if these algorithms are suitably applied, I think we'll be able to make pretty big progress on, on problems, um, and I'll try and build that case for you. There's just so many places that are very, very fruitful. To give you a sense of it, I just want to give you a crude schematic of how I think about these uh, algorithms. What they are, I think, is they take a piece of, uh, a, quite a corpus of data, in this case, a bunch of images with descriptions. So you have that skateboarder, you have other images with somebody having described them. These are then fed into say, take that input. You might have a pretty bad algorithm initially that takes the image and tries to predict, sorry, tries to predict from that image what, the, what is going on. It's like I've never used this before. Um, uh, tries to make a prediction of the description. That prediction then, you check against the truth, you go back to the data, and then you're right or wrong, and then that feeds back to the building of the algorithm. I, I won't go into too much detail on this, but in a nutshell, these algorithms take in data and keep updating the rule they use to predict what the image has a description, whatever the input translates to the output. It's a fairly trivial thing if you think about it, but it's shocking that with enough data, we now have updating rules that have gotten us to be able to do a tremendous number of things. So if you kind of think of that as roughly the black box, you know, I think it's not a coincidence that machine learning and big data have arisen together as sort of two big trends or bubbles. So with this schematic, I want to get to what I think are some of the interesting things. And I think that um, <clears throat> the, the first type of thing that I think where these algorithms are proving to be super helpful, and I think David you, is one of the world experts on this, I'll talk about this. I think they're going to give us what I think of as digital observatories, ways to see the world uh, that we hadn't seen before. And to do this, I'm going to show you one of my uh, favorite papers. Uh, so this is... Um, picture of, of cows. Um, and this is a paper from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And I, I would one day like to publish in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and I would very much like to publish a paper as interesting as this. So what is this paper about? This paper was people who took Google um, satellite images from Google Earth, I think. And you see there are lots of such pictures of cows and other animals you can find on fields in these Google images. Uh, it's not just your house that's on there. Once you move away from your house, there are other things. I think I saw a study once, that's the first thing people look up on Google Maps. They go, oh, where's my house? And that says something it's in and of itself. When they looked at all these images, they found a really strange pattern, which is they just oriented, they just asked themselves, which way are the cows facing in these images? And then they graphed that. And Kind of, this is cattle, and this is the set of data on which way they're facing. And it turns out, on an average, cows 
face north, like magnetic north. And if you thought that was interesting, roe deer, look at the roe deer. They're like right on target. I mean, I don't know what these cows are doing, but these roe deers have got their act together. This is a genuine scientific discovery, actually. Now, you may think, oh, I know what's happening. They use the sun. No, it happens in, independent of where you are in terms of latitude. There's no, there's no, it is magnetic north. How are these animals finding magnetic north? Now, <clears throat> this is what the rest of the talk is going to be about. No, no. <laughs> I, what I'm telling you is imagine what this phenomena really is. People have been around cattle for a long time. And there are some farmers' tales that, oh, cattle. It's not like a well-known fact amongst farmers. That, and it's because of, it's this kind of phenomena that from above and with enough data is completely transparent. But yet, when we live it, it may not be immediately transparent to us. That's one thing. The other thing is this kind of project would have been incredibly burdensome to carry out at any other time in history. You would have had to send RAs all around the world looking at cattle. And that's like a little more fascinating than what they get to do right now, but still, it would have been expensive. And really, you could never have convinced somebody to pay you to send RAs to look at cattle. And so these two features, that we have the ability to see patterns now and the ability to sort of collect a certain kind of data, I think is one of the things that's going to be revolutionary in development. Because if you think of development, of all the problems of development that we face that are real pressing problems from nutrition to health, one of the less discussed problems is we actually find it hard to know what's happening. We don't actually, we can't measure that much. And anyone who's worked in development knows this. Surveying is very expensive. There's just a lot of challenges. And so one of the exciting brands of work, remote sensing, I think the literature that comes from earth sciences has been very powerful in that. And it's starting to make its way into economics. Some of the older papers in this that I found most interesting are best illustrated by this picture. Um, can anyone name uh, the island that is this country? This island? Yeah, this is South Korea. And of course, as we know, South Korea is not an island. Um, you didn't know that, yeah? Um, yeah, I, I didn't know that either. Uh, and it's an, it appears to be an island in this picture because at night, there is no light in North Korea. This is an astonishing fact. If you want to understand how GDP and development and how rich North Korea is, you could look up their annual, you could look at their published figures, you could look at everything, or you could look at this figure. I wish I'd put this up. We actually have, this is from NASA, we actually have one of these from about 20 years ago, and there was actually more light. Uh, it seems to be, at least by this metric, regressing. And why this is interesting is that this is the kind of, just luminosity alone is enough to give us a metric of economic development. And that's one of the things that if you think about it, we could look at these sort of GDP collection, which is done meticulously and in challenging ways, or we could start taking measures such as this. And there's been a lot of work, this is work you guys have done, and there's been a lot of work where then that shows, hey, we can then therefore get down to very granular levels of, um, very granular levels. This is from Nigeria, and you guys are down to, I forgot how many square kilometers you have. Is it 10 square kilometers you have an estimate? Yeah, down to about 10 square kilometers you can see you're able to estimate uh, daily, this is from a consumption expenditure, uh, daily per capita expenditures. And that's pretty remarkable, and it's pretty game changing if you think about it, because we're getting these measures at a level of geographic granularity, we're getting these measures at a level of temporal granularity, it's pretty astonishing. Um, this is the zoom in, this is Uganda, you can see what's happening here. Um, and this is all from the, the, do I say it's a sustainability lab, or do I say this is, sustain lab, I just, yeah, nouns versus adjectives. Um, and so you can see here, this is, um, at, these are all just examples of this that I'm showing. This is Uganda down to districts, blocks. And that's pretty exciting. Another version of this, which is not just using luminosity, is actually using the fact that we see things during the day. An example of what we see is actually forests. And if you want to think about environmental change, you want to think about what's happening to various areas, you can start to then quantify forest cover. You can start to see what's happening with forest co cover across uh, countries. Another exciting domain, I think, is to start stinging to, stringing together other kinds of passive data collection. This is data that's happening without anyone realizing it. One um, 
particularly interesting work that's being done by, by Josh Blumenstock uh, at Berkeley is uh, starting to use uh, cell phone data. Now, cell phone data seems like an interesting place, uh, sort of a, a not obvious place to think about how rich and poor people are. But if you've ever been to a developing country and you've ever had a, someone tell you, uh, call me, I won't answer, but the missed call will give me some signal. For example, call me when you're downstairs and I'll know and I won't even answer. That's when you start to realize as money gets tighter and tighter, you start optimizing everything, including how often you use your phone. And what Josh has done is he's taken data, detailed data on cell phone usage. He's matched it against poverty level data uh, in Rwanda, uh, detailed individual level data as well as district level data, and is able to use cell phone data to create a detailed poverty map of all of Rwanda that is actually changing over time. For example, when people become richer, you see that they make longer phone calls. And so that allows you to infer poverty at this incredibly high grain level. Now we've got satellites, we've got cell phone data, and you can start to see that you can start to form an image of what's happening. And this is what I mean by digital observatories. You're able to observe large features of what's going on. Um, one thing that has not made as much progress, but I think we'll start to see much more progress, is the other place where we see uh, observed people is their interactions with the web. So my, my favorite version of this is a, a figure that a grad student of mine produced. This is um, searches for the phrase iPhone slow. Uh, I think she's been vindicated uh, in the last uh, month or so. And you can see it's actually pretty remarkable. You can just go do this and look at this as a Google Trends. Isn't it weird that there are some spikes? And these, any guesses what these spikes are? Yes, we all know what it is now, don't we? Yeah, people used to think I had a tinfoil hat. I may still have a tinfoil hat, but I feel somewhat vindicated. These are the release dates of the new iPhones, and incumbent users of the old iPhones suddenly find their iPhones mysteriously, for some reason, slowing down. This is not customer complaining. This is literally people saying, what the hell? Why is my phone slow? And we're able to observe something in the aggregate that we couldn't otherwise. Uh, Hal Varian and co-authors have taken insights like this, and in developing countries, have started realizing, huh, if we want to measure things like unemployment, we could wait until the unemployment counts and self-reported unemployment numbers are out, or we could start looking for the kinds of searches that people who are unemployed do. If you want to measure uh, industrial production, say how many cars GM, Ford, et cetera, are going to be selling this, not production, the sales are going to be selling this uh, quarter, you could wait till the official numbers are released, or you could look at searches for GM, Ford, et cetera. And he's found, here's what he finds for cars, for example. He's able to much, uh, much more tightly predict future sales using just the Google Trends. So this is actual sales, and this is the predicted just frame based on Google Trends. And it's an incredibly tightly matching trend, despite being able to do this well before the numbers are ever released, because you already see that in the data. And that's the pretty shocking thing. And now they've done this for unemployment, They've done this for a wide variety of things. So I don't know what that will look like in the development context, but uh, internet-enabled phones are becoming pretty, pretty common there. And so this could be an avenue where it would be pretty, uh, pretty advanced. A final area, which is to leave behind social media, is uh, some work that the uh, UNDP is doing, uh, which is really quite interesting. There are radio signals. Uh, radio is a big part in Uganda. They've basically just taken all of the radio programming all over Uganda with a few transmitters, captured it, and simply just transcribed the whole thing. So now we have a corpus of data that's being built up where we know what is happening on every radio show that anyone could be listening to anywhere in Uganda. And from it, you can start to see how you can see how the national conversation is changing, how ethnic violence might be flaring up, anything. And you're able to now observe this well before, not in an archival sense, but in a real-time sense. And this is some of the preliminary analysis they're doing. About 7.5 million words are spoken every day. And now they've got all of this. And so you can see their coverage across Uganda is pretty impressive. And so this is more just to give you a sense of how we're able to measure a lot more things from these digital observatories. Let me give you a close on a, what I think of as a very interesting example that shows you how obscure uh, this, this field will get in a way that's good. So, one of the things is, if you work in development, that you know is that rain is very, very important. It matters to the lives of every farmer and policymakers. And this is how we know about rain. This is a rain collection station. 
And so we put these in various places. Uh, you know, you have some amount of coverage. And you have to have a certain number. But I think it's fair to say we don't have that many of them. And the coverage in many countries is not that great. Anyone know what this is? It's a cell tower. There's been some recent work which suggests this is also a rainfall measurement device. The reason it's a rainfall measurement device is that these cell phone towers are constantly sending status update pings to each other from tower to tower, just verifying service all the time. You know what happens to those pings when there's water in the air? Yeah, there's a slight degradation. And it turns out just from the ping data, you can infer what rainfall is. Which means we now have have, in most countries, are pretty saturated with these towers, far greater measures of rainfall, more precise measures, potentially, if they could build this out to be able to be done real time than we ever could have dreamt by putting up these things. This just gives you a sense of what I think once people become imaginative about the sort of latent passive data collection that's out there and turn them towards problems that really matter for development, such as rainfall measurement, how I think we'll start to see a remarkable number of things. So that's what I want, one of the things I want to talk about is digital observatories with satellites, cell phone data, search data. I think drones are something that are starting to be, I know drones have acquired such a bad name in recent times, but, um, but drones have, have, are starting to be very powerful as a way because satellites are pretty high up. It's pretty cheap to fly drones over large areas and take uh, low level satellite imaging. So social media, I think my favorite here is using Twitter as a measure of commuting times and commute data. Um, so, all right. I think digital observatories are pretty impressive. I think they'll be useful for getting money to the right place, knowing what's happening where, and just dramatically improving our understanding of what's happening. I always go back and think that Summers Heston, which is a data set that many of you who uh, do research and development probably have heard of, but otherwise would probably never have heard of, is actually instrumental in changing the field of development because it is what gave us all of the growth data that thousands of papers have been written on, and much of our understanding of growth comes from this one data set. That's crazy. If you could build and pay for a data, this data is paid for itself factors of thousands of times. Now we have a chance to build data like this at a whole new level, at a level that will really transform how the entire field of development happens. So that, I think for me, is one of the exciting things that I see people doing. The second thing besides digital observatories that I want to talk about comes from a project in the US that we've worked on. And in this project, what I want to uh, just uh, put aside the development thing for a second, but to me this was uh, informative. This is a project on, um, on incarceration. Uh, as you may or may not know, there are about 12 million arrests every year in the United States. I did not know this fact. I don't know if you guys knew this number was this big. That is a crazy big number, 12 million arrests. Another thing I learned was that right after arrest, people uh, are, give, are sent to a judge within about 24 hours where the judge makes a pretty important decision in this person's life. Nothing to do with the crime that they've committed. Actually, quite unrelated to that. The judge has to decide between now and when the trial happens, will this person be sent home or they will they be sent to jail? Now, this is really a consequential decision. About three-quarters of a million people are in jail at any moment in time. Now, if you think the US incarceration is around uh, a little over between two and three million, that means a huge fraction of people at any moment in time sitting incarcerated are just waiting for trial. They're not found guilty of anything. They're just waiting. They're in limbo. And they're going to be in limbo. And why do I keep saying it's consequential? The average length of time in jail is about two to three months. In some jurisdictions, the average is nine to 12 months. That's why for many crimes, time served, if you were put in jail, is the penalty. So it's quite shocking that a judge is going to have to decide whether you basically lose your job, lose your rights, go off for two to three months, not because you're guilty. Actually, by law, the judge is only asked to do one thing, which is to predict whether you are a flight risk or whether you're a public safety risk. If I were to send you home, will you come back? If I were to send you home, will you commit a crime while you're out? We found this project interesting because if I go back to the sort of the idea of what these algorithms do, isn't it amazing the judge is acting like an algorithm? The judge is being given a new input, what's the defendant's history, and is generating an output. Will they commit a crime? And we have tons of data. We have tons of data on past defendants in and out. And so we just train an algorithm to do the same thing. You can very easily just ask, well, then what would happen? How would an algorithm do? This 
Context is, I think, pretty interesting because it's a case where we're not trying to change how the legal system works. We've literally set up, we found a problem where the sole goal was just to predict. So let's see how the algorithm does. What we did was we had the algorithm rank people by criminality and then say, if you were to release you know, a certain fraction, who would you release and what would your performance be? And so you can see here, if you release no one, this is close to the US solution, uh, you get no crime. If That's not actually true. We release quite a few people. If you release everyone, you get the total crime rate in the population. So this is, this is the performance of the algorithm that I've sort of graphed out. We need to benchmark it against something. So why don't we benchmark it against judges? Judges release about 73.7% of the population. And for that rate, the algorithm produces about an 8.5% crime rate. Judges produce about an 11.3% crime rate, which is a shocking cap. It means you can reduce crime by 25% by doing nothing besides just reordering who you release and who you don't. You're not incarcerating more people, you're just incarcerating a different population. You could also say, hey, if I was okay with 11.3% crime, why don't I go horizontally on this graph and release as many people as I need to? In that case, you'd be able to release about 84.6% of people, which would reduce jail populations by about 41%. To me, this is indicative of a class of problems that we're now starting to find, which is whenever, whenever we're in the business of simply predicting something and giving out resources or penalties as a result, algorithms potentially could have huge deltas by just simply helping us make that prediction better. I think what was appealing to me here is that these are not extra costs. People trying to work on reducing incarceration, usually it's something pretty costly. Re-ranking means we're not spending net more resources, we're just changing how the things are spent. And that category of, um, of, of problems is pretty big. I won't talk about this today, but one of the uh, more interesting things is that these effects are even bigger if you focus on violent crime outcomes. And interestingly, they also reduce racial disparities. And you can imagine why that is, because, yeah, I won't go into the obvious implication. Um, so to me, this is a category of a proactive policy, I think, starts to be locked up. So we can kind of ask questions, what could we do differently if we could predict a little better? One of the places where I find this so, so interesting is in uh, famine relief. In development, this is a perennial problem. You can be sure to read every few years a big famine in Bangladesh, which now all of a sudden, or in a particular country, in fact, as The Guardian put it in this one article, Nigeria's food crisis by the time famine is declared is too late. This is kind of a canonical problem you've all read about. Yet, as we talked about with the remote sensing, it's not that implausible that we'd be able to see famines coming before they came. At the very least, we'd be able to predict agricultural production pretty accurately. That's not completely determinative of where a famine's gonna happen, but it's at least a really good start when we know agricultural production is gonna be very low. And here's some work that um, gives an example of this. This is just by looking at satellite images. You can see these are crop data. You can kind of see how the crops are doing and how the crops are progressing. And from this form, vegetative health indices of what's happening in each area. And that's kind of an interesting element because we might even know what yield is gonna be down for each little area before the farmer themselves knows what yield is gonna be. Because you can kind of see we're looking from above and are able to make predictions based on what the vegetation looks like from above and color. The farmer is looking this way and only sees a small sample. So we're in this perverse situation where we might be able to help target famine, uh, prevent famines, but even go to individual farmers and be able to say, look, your yield is looking like it might be low. What kind of uh, proactive policies can we take in terms of savings, in terms of prepayment of insurance, et cetera? So that to me is the example of bail. The other example that is like bail, which I wanna um, uh, uh, close on, is actually poverty targeting. Every program, every country that you know of engages in this activity. You know, you know of a food transfer program, you know of a cash transfer program, they all have to decide who's poor. What's shocking about that is that these billions and billions of dollars are going through this makes it amongst the most important decisions. Every few years, countries tend to do something to decide what their targeting rule is going to be. How it's done is actually just shocking given where we are now. It's a remarkably outdated infrastructure. 
you would run some national survey. The LSMS surveys the World Bank runs are often used. You ask people their consumption. You have a sample of what, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 maybe. You would then take the cons reported consumption levels. You would then run a regression, have some scorecard. That's it. That's how you've decided who is poor and who's not. Imagine how transformative it's going to be. And, and people are already starting to work on this if you started using things like images of the houses from above and to the extent how advanced do they look. There's just a ton of data we could bring to this problem and a ton of machinery we can bring because this is a pure prediction problem. We are just saying, give me the inputs of everything you know about this person. Tell me the output. Are they poor or not? There's other complexity, of course, but for the purposes of how these governments are doing it, which is just input to output, that is just a pure prediction problem. And so I think the second element of all of this is what I think of proactive policy. Let me conclude on what I think of as a personalized policy. And I think I have like a couple of minutes, so I think I'll be able to finish early. So I think here, one of the areas that I think is extremely promising is, um, again, in agriculture. We're very used to sort of, all of you have heard of uh, precision medicine. And so now there's a buzz phrase, precision agriculture, which I think is a great buzz phrase. Um, which is, think of a poor farmer. One of the most difficult choices they make, by far, is the choice of what to plant. You make the right planting decision, lots of yield. Wrong planting decision, low yields. What makes that decision so complicated is that it is a precision decision. Yes, there are some things that are right overall, maybe based on season, maybe based on how rainfall is looking for everyone in your village. But by and large, it's very specific to the soil that is in your ground and to the conditions that are there right now. And this is an example where Algorithms can be very helpful because they'll be able to transform a huge variety of inputs from soil testing um, to climactic prediction to uh, the, the topology of the area to be able to make a prediction of what yields will look like for a variety of crops. Of course, there's a bunch of delivery about how you get this out there. But this is another place where I think we have a pure prediction problem. Just predict for this crop what we think will happen and we'll be able to, I think, be quite transformative. A final one is, um, some really interesting work that uh, researchers at Yale and other places have done on rural migration. What they did was a very interesting uh, project where they subsidized and they gave people uh, about a $19 transportation subsidy to help people in the lean season migrate to urban areas for work. It's a pretty low level subsidy. What I found most impressive about their study was the impact of this, not just on the people, whether did they migrate or not, but through the fact that remittances were being sent home huge effects on what's happening at home. One of the most impressive effects I found was the caloric consumption. So they found about an increase in about 700 calories consumed per day back at home, which for a $19 transfer is a very good buy if that's all you're getting. I'm raising this because it shows you that, obviously this by itself has nothing to do with what I've been talking about, but it illustrates, I think, one of the deep problems that people face, which is, should I migrate? And if so, where should I migrate? Where will the returns be highest for my kind of labor and for who I am? Which again, in the entire labor market space, is one of the most basic things. This is about seasonal migration. There are a lot of day workers who have to decide where they're gonna, whether they're going to go work, all of which is very basic sort of prediction. And so I just want to conclude on this. I think there are sort of uh, three things I take away from this. I think this work, as people are doing it, has the potential to really fill out the toolbox. I think that in development, we have an increasing set of tools that we have, but we could always use more tools to fight poverty. And some of the later things I'm describing are just more machinery for dealing with poverty. I'd be remiss, though, to, if I didn't uh, lay out one thing, which is I feel like development of all fields has been very prone to the silver bullet phenomena, which is this is going to solve, this is not going to solve poverty. But it's going to be pretty high return activity for moving the needle on individuals' lives. The final thing I'll conclude is that I'm quite certain that all the things I described, um, I have surely not hit upon what will be the big game changer in this area. Because I think what's going to happen is as people start working on these things, technology is highly nonlinear, and there are going to be some pretty surprising discoveries people have had. I certainly never in my right mind would have thought 
oh, we can use um, cell towers to predict rainfall, nor would I have thought all cows face north. So for me, I think that's the most exciting component, which is finding out which way the cows face in this area. So, all right, thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks very much, Sendil. That was a great, um, great presentation. And we're going to have an opportunity now for um, the audience to ask a bunch of questions. And I'll just I'll start us off with a few. My first question to Sendil was actually whether his MacArthur Award was before or after he was on the board. And he assured me it was before. So there was no, no funny, no funny business there. We meant not to look this up. So, you know, we've. As you said, we've both been in the business of kind of proving what's possible with these transformative technologies. And it's quite exciting in terms of, in a sense, how poorly things are targeted and how poorly things are done in a lot of areas now. But one of the things that I've, I guess, run into is that people have a, a really strong desire for um, a story and interpretation of why the model is working. And one of the things that machine learning does, I think, is predict really well, but often without the interpretability of some simpler models. And even when you can show somebody that you know, the, the um, out of sample predictions are better, uh, there is a privilege given to sort of the, the simple story, even if it doesn't have that same um, accuracy. So, it, and I noticed in the examples you were giving, a lot of them are about sort of the potential of proactive policy. But in your experience, has there been that uptake of that into policy, or has it been stymied by this desire to have, have a good narrative of being able to, to say, this is why we're predicting that this person should be released and this person should be put in jail. Yeah, I think here I'll put on, I, at times I, I, I have done behavioral science. Here, I, I'll, let me put on my behavioral science hat. I think that right now what we have is things are so, as, as your work is the best in this area, as you, it's, things are so early days. It's not like we're, we're late in the sales cycle where you've tried to sell it to lots of people and have faced lots of resistance. And in early days of sales, I think it's always remarkable to me how there's just some vague resistance to things that quickly fades away with time. And so let me give the best example of this is, um, I wish I'd brought this uh, picture. It's great. It's a picture of um, Otis, of Otis Elevator Company, uh, standing there. I think you're in New York. He's about to cut the rope on the elevator just to show people that like these automatic brakes are okay and you can be in an elevator and nothing's gonna happen. Because people used to be really scared of elevators. And it was one of the reasons we have elevator music. It's to calm people down. And people were so scared, this is not a joke, like when automatic elevators came in. For about 10 to 20 years, you still had people, the elevator operator, in the elevator, pushing the buttons for people. Because people were scared with the automatic elevator. And now, if you got into an elevator and someone was there to push buttons for you, you would assume, well, maybe it's a grad student who's finally lost it, but by and large, you would just assume it's a crazy person of some kind. We don't want, I, I can push my own button. But that's an element of, I think, with these technologies, there's just, you know, just familiarity. And I, I think that that is a big hindrance, just pure familiarity. I often ask this question, which is like, if on, a, on your next flight, the pilot says, oh, you know, we're heading in for landing, and there are these heavy crosswinds, which makes for a technically very difficult landing. I'm trained to do that, so you're all fine. But we also have uh, uh, autopilot software that's specially designed for this. Uh, in the spirit of democracy, I'm going to ask for a vote on this plane. Uh, how many of you would like me to do it? And how many would you like me to turn on the autopilot? I'm actually kind of curious. By a show of hands, how many of you would say, no, no, I want the pilot to do it? A few people, yeah, well, yeah. But it's shocking how many of you would be like, don't be a hero, just push the button and sit back and let's all be safe. So that's a sense in which you can see people get quite familiar and comfortable with technology. That's my optimistic interpretation, is I actually just think it's a, not about interpretability, but familiarity. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense. I think another thing we've, we've thought about a lot, and this is in, especially in the context of this new center on poverty and we have this data for development initiative is we're in Silicon Valley and, and many of those potential digital observatories you talked about, um, are, you know, some of the big companies collecting that data are right here. 
and then there's obviously companies all over, but it is actually quite a challenge to convince um, many of the holders of these data, which are private sector actors who I think themselves is, you know, understand just as well as we do the potential value of this type of data, um, both for public and private good, um, to convince them to, um, to use that in a, in a public good kind of way. And, I, and I, I think part of it is the perceived risk of how it could be used for, for you know, purposes that they don't maybe anticipate and aren't good. But part of it is probably just a, a business decision on their, point, uh, on their part, and I wonder, um, as we look forward and, and we see the power of this information, is this going to be a power that's really going to be um, able to be realized by the public sector and, the, and for the public good, or do you, do you worry at all about, about it um, not realizing its potential? And yeah, I mean, what, what are the arguments we can make to sort of facilitate that? That's a great question. Uh, I mean, the cell phone towers for rainfall prediction, I mean, cell phone companies are often private companies and they own those towers and why should they give you that ping data? Why should they start storing that data? I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I, this is, maybe I'm just optimistic, but I, I kind of feel like at least if we can show, as you I'm just repeating what you said, if we can show that there's enormous promise, that it, I would have thought some companies would hopefully start to say, oh, this is, we have a CSR division, which gives away some money, but this is a way we can give away some it's just the ping data. And look, we can change the world. So I, I would hope that some low-hanging fruit, but have you had any, I mean, what, what has been some of the, well, I'm I've, curious what you've done to. You showed the example of, um, of Rwanda that Josh Blumenstock has done. Yeah. And, and I think one of the challenges in reproducing that elsewhere, and he talks about this a lot, is, is uh, you know, it's a lot easier said than done to, to get the data from these providers. Yeah. And, um, and then you talk about social media data, which is penetration is, is very high, as you said but it's a lot easier said than done to, to um, get that in the public domain. And so, I, you know, there's, there's understandable reasons for, for not wanting to do that. Um, I mean, I would imagine that one pathway, though I'm loathe to kind of take that, is we know census agencies have overcome a lot of these, getting governments to report, getting companies to report accurately a lot of their production data as part of the census infrastructure. And you could imagine this eventually being rolled up into that type of regulatory and legal infrastructure as part of government census data. I'm loath to go down that path because you would have hoped that there's just some, you know, without having to go all the way to changing regulations, but that could be a way that you can imagine this playing out. Yeah, I think in, in another positive element is that not all of the data is privately held, so a lot of the public imagery is quite good, and, and that's what a lot of the, the, the recent work is based on. Um, just being aware of the time, I think it's a good it's a good chance now to open it up for broader questions. I have others, but um, but I know a lot of you guys have an interest and in a lot of experience in this topic. Start up here, and, and um, I'm also supposed to remind you to wait and please introduce yourself briefly uh, before your question. Hi, I'm Sue Coffall, I'm a former board member at CEPR, and I love SCID now, the new center for global poverty and development. And the one thing I think about when I think about things like that is are we, are we going to mutate human judgment out of everything, ultimately? Because, you know, if we make everything autonomous and we um, do all these predictions, will we lose some of the sort of insight, the, the great brain we have inside us? Will be developing um, at a, will it be stop developing because we're going to use um, this technology? I, I just worry about judgment. I, I want to drive my car and I want to use my judgment. I want to ride a horse and I want to use my judgment. I don't want to be up there saying, will the horse kick or not or dump me. I want to, so what do you think about judgment with regard to all this human uh, judgment? I mean, I, I think that in a lot of these places where it appears there's automation, in some of them I think there's genuine automation and I really think it's, it's the equivalent of, you know, we don't do artisanal accounting anymore. You don't have an accountant be like, no, no, I'm going to add them up by hand. You know, I'm just much better at arithmetic. So some things are of that variety. But I do think there are a lot of these examples that you read about where it's grossly overstated. So and I think there are two reasons it's grossly overstated. Um, one reason it's grossly overstated is, and they both have to do with measurement. Um, one reason it's grossly overstated is algorithms are only as good at, at as in predicting whatever the outcome variable exactly that you happen to measure. So you might read about papers saying, oh, algorithms are better at this deciding who's going to be a good employee. Oh, that's funny. I didn't know we had a variable we measured called good employee. 
oh, no, no, we've got you know, uh, performance. Oh, I see, that's interesting. So you really think that employee who gets really high performance ratings is the only thing you care about? No, of course not. So then already you're telling me that huge amounts of judgment have to creep in because the variable that the algorithm is predicting is only one of the many variables that come into a decision, whether to promote or hire or promote. And that's a big wedge. If you often look at these things, the way they're described, they're described semantically, good employee. But then you have to sort of scratch the surface and say, but what is actually being predicted? And if I were in the business of promotion, that would only be a tiny fraction of it. I think the biggest example of that in our work is the bail example I gave is about pre-incarceration. So that is pre-trial. So there, the only thing we predict is, will you commit a crime or will you flee? And it turns out those are the only things you should care about for pretrial by law. Roll it forward and think about the sentencing decision or think about the parole release decision. Yeah, a parole committee cares about recidivism, but they care about a lot more. So simply having a recidivism predictor doesn't automate judgment. In other words, I think these algorithms are excellent at quantifying parts of the inputs. But most of our judgments are actually pretty complex. And I just do not think that's going away anytime soon. Though you may not want to drive your car after a little bit, but that's a separate issue, I think. But will she be allowed to drive her car? Will she be allowed? <laughs> Pass green. A really good question, I guess, is um, if there's a massive amount of things that we can look at, we still have to choose which one to look at. So I'm not right now dying to know why cows face north. Uh, maybe I should. I don't know. <laughs> I always just have been asking. I, how do they know what's north? No, no, but... but, uh, but, I'm, but I'm joking. I'm really... I'm, <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm actually quite curious. But it's... Uh, we, we, you know, many, many, many patterns may be not relevant uh, as much for important issues. So how do you, one question is, in a world of big data and, and, and smart machines, how do we make sure that we don't get lost um, identifying patterns that maybe are not first order? No, I, mean, I think that's, what these data sets do is they give us a ton of data, and which I think raises the premium for figuring out what question you're going to ask. What variables are you going to predict? Because these aren't, these algorithms, I don't know if you know of any such good examples, but I've not really found many good examples where you turn the algorithm loose on a data set and it finds interesting things. Because it has no idea what interesting is. Interesting is in your head, not a, it's not even a definable thing. So most of these techniques are, work well when you say try to predict this, but when you're trying to struck, and I do think that it's going to raise the premium because now there's so much you could look at. And we saw this a little bit when you first saw surveys like the general social survey come out. I don't know if you guys know this. These are surveys where they ask hundreds of questions, like on everything you can, every opinion thing you can imagine. It was this flurry of kind of like, gee, we can look at everything. What do we look at now? And you know, that looks small relative to what we have now. But you know, in the opinion world, it was pretty big. And it did make things harder at some level because you had to choose more wisely. So I think you're, I, you know, I think you're quite right. I think an, an aspect of that, though, is you do have to sort of specify the, the things you're trying to predict, but recognizing that a lot of the things we're used to measuring are, are probably historical, sort of the result of historically what we could measure. So we measure poverty by how much did you spend in the last month, because we can ask people how much did you spend in the last month. Maybe a more relevant measure in terms of whether somebody's poor is whether they can turn on a light switch or whether they have you know, enough food or area to grow food or things like that. And so it is, um, it is the case that you want to specify, I think, but you probably want to think much more creatively. And some things that might be much easier to measure now um, weren't even in the, in the conversation a decade or two ago. That's a great example. I mean, one of the things I would find interesting is we can't really see there isn't as much tweeting. But I think in, the, in areas where there is a lot of tweeting, we have had people to the point that you're describing, look at the natural language data that's being produced and start asking questions like, what is on the minds of low-income individuals? Who are? And so that's a place where it's a little closer to that. And then instead of flipping the thing and saying, let me not go in with the prejudgment of what I'm looking for, let me, measure, let me not measure sentiment of each tweet, let me actually ask the content of what is being tweeted about, might I learn something interesting about that? So I think totally, yeah. totally agree. 
have one in the corner back there. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, Susan Young, I do some work on development and natural resources, um, kind of conservation. Um, I had two quick things. One I hadn't even thought of until I heard some women talking about language. For a writer, I found it interesting that your title had no punctuation. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I've been sitting here thinking, what does that mean about what you think about your topic? Um, that you didn't put a comma, you didn't put a question mark, you didn't put a period. Anyway, that's a little frivolous, but I am thinking about it. Um, the broader question was, I've been reading Kate Rayworth's book, um, Donut Economics. I don't know if you've heard about it. Um, it's very interesting. It talks about living in a safe space. So instead of linear models on uh, micro and macroeconomics, it moves to systems work. And it talks about how do we live safely within natural resources and also within social programs so that everybody kind of lives in the donut. Nobody falls in the hole and we don't explode out <laughs> um, because we've used up natural resources. If you haven't heard of her, then it's not a relevant question, but it's intriguing because she's bringing systems work and the ways you think about in systems to what used to be linear in economic work. So I, I just it's didn't know if you had any economics? observations. It's donut economics, is that right? Donut economics, yeah. Yeah, I haven't. Do you know this? No. No, no punctuation in that title either? <laughs> <laughs> donut, comma, economics. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I don't know about it. I mean, there is a, a branch of other work that I know a little about that tries to bring systems, but not in the way I think you're describing sort of dynamic systems and interacting agents into the into economics, like at the Santa Fe Institute. But that, but I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know about that. So um, we're almost out of time, but I have, as I said, some more questions. And I guess um, maybe, maybe this is another um, sort of negative type of outlook or, or just asking you to think negatively is because I think the positives are, are quite clear in, in terms of the, the tremendous power of this, the, um, you know, all the good that could be done with the, the billions of dollars that are not being spent well now that could be spent well or all the policies that are not being targeted well that could be um, done well. But it's also probably the case that there are lots of uh, bad things that people aren't able to do very well now either. And I wonder if, if there's anything that keeps you up at night in particular of, of how these things could be used either in the public sector or in the private sector to discriminate more effectively to, um, you know, to target in a bad way. And, and, and have you seen any, let's say, creative examples of that surfacing or anything you worried about as, as you get into this? I mean, we, we've already seen as a collective one huge consequence of this, which is uh, surveillance work has been transformed. And I think sort of our ability, if you, I mean, here's some nightmare scenarios that are already, that aren't even so nightmarish. You couldn't really do um, metadata on cell phones and start to really track all this without this type of work. You couldn't say, like, it's great when you see it uh, on a police show, but oh, here's the criminal. Let's look at CCTV footage and see if they've been spotted anywhere. That's a lot of visual processing of a lot of CCTV cameras. But that's also pretty frightening. I mean, very frightening if you think about it. So in some sense, I think by governments, this does raise the capacity of governments to do quite a bit. And that's good and very bad. And so yeah, I think that's a big issue. And firms, obviously, there's some elements of, of this that goes on where I think we've started to see some you know, classic examples in financial services. Um, you know, we know there are things like uh, teaser rates, which were just pretty bad. And it was a nice policy. You would give a low credit card rate and then jack it up later knowing that people never switch. But now, you can do things like, let me find people who pay late fees all the time, but who never actually default. Let me really target those customers and give them low rates and big late fees. That's very profitable. It's a great strategy. And you know, that, by the way, that's how the suit paid for itself. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, much, it's a much better suit than it looks. Uh, and the, but that, that, that sort of stuff, I think, definitely is going to happen. And I don't know what we can do collectively about that. But that, I, I agree with you. I think that is yeah. one of the big negatives that we face. 
Yeah. Well, hopefully that is all outweighed by all of the great positives. Um, all right. Well, we have a, uh, a reception. I guess Grant will tell you about that part. So. No, I was just going to say, please join me in uh, thanking both Sendel and David for their time tonight. Right. So I, before I let you go, I will just tell you, I hope you'll join us on February 15th. We'll be back with Sam Cortum, who will be speaking on gains from trade and inequality. Um, there's no punctuation in that title. Uh, if you want to know what he has in mind, you'll have to join us. So I hope you will. Thank you again. Thank you to Sendel and David again. <laughs>